When trusses are used in buildings, they usually function as the main supporting elements of roof systems where long spans are required. In this type of construction, one end of the connection of the truss to the walls usually can be considered as pinned and the other as roller supported. Thus, the truss can be analyzed as an externally statically determinate structure. Roof trusses normally are spaced uniformly along the length of the building and are tied together by longitudinal beams called purlins and by X bracing. The primary function of the purlins is to transfer loads to the top cord of the truss, but they can also act as part of the bracing system. Bracing is usually provided in the planes of both the top and bottom cords, but it is not required in every bay because lateral forces can be transferred from one braced bay to the other through the purlins. Sag rods are tension members used to provide lateral support for the purlins. Let's have a look at the system from the top. Most of the loads applied to the purlins are vertical, so there will be a component parallel to a sloping roof which will cause the purlin to bend or sag in that direction. Sag rods can be located at the midpoint, the third points, or at more frequent intervals along the purlins depending on the amount of support needed. The interval is a function of the truss spacing, the slope of the top cord, the resistance of the purlin to this type of bending, and the amount of support furnished by the roofing. If a metal deck is used, it will usually be rigidly attached to the purlins, and sag rods may not be needed. Sometimes, however, the weight of the purlin itself is enough to cause problems, and sag rods may be needed to provide support during construction before the deck is in place. If sag rods are used, they are designed to support the component of roof loads parallel to the roof. A possible treatment at the peak or ridge is shown in figure A. Each segment between purlins is assumed to support everything below it. Although the force will be different in each segment of rod, the usual practice is to use one size throughout. The extra amount of material in question is insignificant and the use of the same size for each segment eliminates the possibility of a mix-up during construction. Let's design a sag rod together based on a real example. Fink trusses spaced at 20 feet on centers support W6 by 12 purlins as shown. The purlins are supported at their midpoints by sag rods. Use A36 steel and design the sag rods and the tie rod at the ridge for the following service loads. Metal deck that weighs 2 pounds per square foot, built up roof that weighs 5 pounds per square foot, snow load of 18 pounds square foot of horizontal projection of the roof surface, the weight of the purlin that is 12 pounds per foot length. The tributary width for each sag rod is equal to the distance between trusses divided by 2. The tributary area for the deck and built up roof is equal to 466 square foot. The dead load coming from the deck and the roof is 3262 pounds. The weight of the purlins in the tributary width is 1080 pounds. The total dead load is then 4342 pounds. The tributary area for snow load is the projected area and thus is 45 multiplied by the tributary width 10. The total snow load is then 8100 pounds. From ASCE 7, we obtain the governing load combination. To resolve for the component parallel to the roof, we multiply the ultimate vertical load by the ratio of the height of the truss to the slope length of the truss. We can then use this load to calculate the required cross-sectional area from equation D2-2 of the AISC specifications. 
To resolve for the tie rod at the ridge, we multiply the ultimate vertical load by the ratio of the slope length of the truss to the projected length of the truss. We can then use this load to calculate the required cross-sectional area from equation D2-2 of the AISC specifications. Refer to table 7-2 of the AISC specifications to determine the rod diameter required. In this case, the greater area is this and thus this size is sufficient. For the usual truss geometry and loading, the bottom cord will be in tension and the top cord will be in compression. Some web members will be in tension and others will be in compression. When wind effects are included and consideration is given to different wind directions, the force in some web members may alternate between tension and compression. In this case, the affected member must be designed to function as both a tension member and a compression member. In bolted trusses, double angle sections are frequently used for both cord and web members. This design facilitates the connection of members meeting at a joint by permitting the use of a single gusset plate on which the cords and the webs will be bolted. When structural T-shapes are used as cord members in welded trusses, the web angles can usually be welded to the stem of the T. If the force in a web member is small, single angles can be used, although doing so eliminates the plane of symmetry from the truss and causes the web member to be eccentrically loaded. Cord members are usually fabricated as continuous pieces and spliced if necessary. The fact that cord members are continuous and joints are bolted or welded would seem to invalidate the usual assumption that the truss is pin connected. Joint rigidity does introduce some bending moment into the members, but it is usually small and considered to be a secondary effect. The usual practice is to ignore it. Bending caused by loads directly applied to the members between the joints, however, must be taken into account. Let's design a bottom cord member of a truss. The trusses are welded and spaced at 20 feet. The bottom cord connection is made with 9 inch long longitudinal welds at the flange. Use A992 steel and the following loads. There is a dead load coming from the roof, metal deck, insulation, as well as weight of the purlins as well as snow load. Remember that the span between trusses is 20 feet, and thus the area is the length of the truss, 40 multiplied by 20. The weight of the purlins is found by multiplying the unit weight by the length of each purlin by the number of purlins. The weight of the truss is estimated by taking 10% of the sum of those loads. The interior dead and snow loads will then be determined followed by the exterior loads, which will have half of the tributary area. We use the load combination to find the applied interior and exterior point loads. Due to symmetry, the reaction forces would be half of the vertical loads. The bottom cord segment in the middle of the span will have the highest tensile force and thus we make a cut at section A-A. -A. By taking the moment around point E, we can find the tension in member IJ as follows. We determine then the minimum gross and effective areas required. We then refer to table 1-9 of the AISC manual to pick the structural T with a size slightly greater than the gross area required. And thus we choose MT5 by 3.75. Since this is a connection with longitudinal welds only, the shear lag factor U is 0 0.808. This gives us an effective area of 0 0.897, which is less than the required effective area of 0 
and thus we choose a bigger section, so let's try MT6 by 5. The shear lag factor U is then 0 0.7602. This gives us an effective area of 1.13, which is larger than the required effective area of 0 0.985, and thus it's OK. Also, the slenderness of the bottom cord is fine considering that it is braced at the panel points. Alternatively, we can model and analyze this problem with a finite element software. I assumed the webs to be double angle long leg back to back 2.5 inches long, 1.5 inches wide and a quarter inch thick members. The loads are applied exactly as done previously where the interior loads differ from the exterior loads. We can model the truss by either fully releasing the moment at the web member ends acting as a hinged connection and by that we receive a maximum tensile force of 47.78 kips. Or we can model the truss by fully releasing the moment at the web and cord intersections. And by that we receive a maximum tensile force of 48.02 kips, which is almost exactly the same as tension calculated by hand under the same assumptions. Note that regardless of what members we use for the webs, the result will always be the same because this system is statically determinate. Also note that when using the program's built-in design capabilities, the program will determine that the section size MT5 by 3.75 is sufficient when in fact it is not as we have seen previously. Note that the utilization ratio of 0.961 is coming from the required gross area divided by the available area. This does not consider the end welded conditions that would determine the shear lag factor U. This makes the available effective area 0.897 square inches and the required effective area is 0.985 square inches. This will make the utilization ratio greater than 1 and thus classifying the member as insufficient for this load. This emphasizes the importance of joint assessment, whether by a specialized software or by hand. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.